Okay, it's time. It's time to start. Okay, so Megan, just let me know if we can start. I can. You can start. Okay, shall we? Okay, everybody. So I see we have um, a lot of people in the room. So just before we start, I just want to give you a few um, a few announcements about how I'm planning to do this. So if um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Feel free to um, just open your mic and say, Paulo, I have a question, excuse me, or something. And it will be great to discuss. And I think, in fact, I think it's um, it's even better if we, you know, if you guys talk and, and so I can see and understand the type of questions and the type of doubts you have so we can discuss um, uh, specific points, okay? So I wanna do this very interactive. So before, uh, so just to introduce myself, my name is Paulo Teixeira, I'm a senior TA. I took PPCR in 2015, uh, and then I did the workshop in 2016, because I couldn't do on the 15. Um, and then I came to Dr. Fragney's lab since uh, on 2017, and I've been here since uh, doing my PhD. So I'm in the final phase of my PhD, and um, I, I love to help at PPCR. Okay, so we're here talking about, about missing data and also covariate adjustment. Uh, so just to make sure everybody can see my video, correct? My, my, uh, my slide here, missing data, wish you were here. Uh, if you can't see, just let us know. If you're having troubles with the audio, just let us know, okay? Okay, so just up to plan a little bit the lecture. So I organized like the first part, we can uh, discuss the case. Uh, so the first step will be to discuss the case study that uh, um, was for this week. And um, before that, you know, just give a basic brief knowledge on, on uh, missing data. And then we'll talk about the uh, mechanisms of missing data and give some examples and then um, finish with the covariate adjustment so this is more a discussion, lecture, uh, uh, examples part, and then we will move to exercises. So um, you guys have a couple of data sets that was posted on Classroom, Google Classroom. Um, if you don't have it, I can put it in the chat right now. Um, and then the idea is to kind of see and practice how those things that we discussed, the mechanism of missing data and how to deal with that uh, how can we uh, do that in practice, okay? And also an example of covariate adjustment. Um, um, I, have, I have actually two examples, um, so we can we can discuss, all right? All right, so first is the case study. So I'd like someone to kind of try to summarize and speak a little bit about the case study. Um, and, and also I want you to understand that I'm not Dr. Fragni, so I don't I don't want you to feel intimidated. So this is a safe environment. Um, I feel like I'm a student, just like you guys uh, learning every day. So please let's make this very very um, relaxed and, and and comfortable. Okay. So can someone uh, talk about the case a little bit and summarize? Uh, I could I can talk. Okay, Mariana. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the case, our case, our case this week is about um, a clinical trial with a lot of missing data, and Dr. Strong is an endocrinologist, and he he is dealing with clinical trials for uh, weight weight loss for twenty years, but at this time he was a little bit um, optimist, and. He, plan he didn't have um, a protocol for the missing data. He was expecting 5% and then he had 40%. So now he, he has a challenge because he, 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 need, um, he needs um, to deal with this data. And yeah, this is the challenge for this case. Wow, that's a great, great summary. Anybody want to add anything? <laughs> But that was a great summary. I don't think you can beat that. Hi, can you hear yes. me? Uh, uh, yeah, as I, I think, I think we, we, we can try to 
P I T C uh P I C O T to to summarize this. And I think the P is thirteen uh post mass poultry women a uh, woman and the I is uh, antikinase diet. O is uh, stand standard diet. Oh uh, sorry, C is standard diet diet and O is weight loss and T is uh, twelve months. Great, uh, great, great. Yeah, so you're talking about the PICO um you're breaking down the PICO question of the study from Dr. Strong, right? Yes, yes. Yes, that's good. I have it here. Let's let's look at it together real quick. But before we touch into that, um, and I think um, Mariana already said, so the main problem with the study, um, it's the missing data, correct? Everybody agree with that? And I want to just to make sure I understand why this is a problem. So why should Dr. Strong bother about, um, you know, why is he worried about? Can someone uh, elaborate a little bit on that. So why why it's important to not have missing data? So why why do you think that? So uh, in this uh, missing data would uh, lead to decreased uh, sample size, and uh, the in the beginning when they started off at the randomization phase, uh, uh, the way they had divided them into control and uh, intervention group, standard diet and uh, this uh, modified Atkins diet, uh, it won't end up uh, with the same numbers uh, for comparison uh, at the end of the study. And uh, so it decreases your uh, 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 power so, and uh, basically decreases uh, your uh, validity of the results. And uh, so I think that's what he's concerned about. And... Uh, uh, that's why uh, he he wants to initially he talks about classifying the uh, missing data into uh, uh, MCAR uh, missing completely at random, missing at random, and missing not at random. And then uh, talks about uh, different methods of analysis. Uh, goes on to talk about different methods of analysis, how to handle that missing data. Yeah. No, that's great. Let's go one thing at a time. And, and that's a great um, um, summary, Anash. Uh, so you talked about, so the first thing that is very logical, right, um, everyone, is uh, we have less people, right? So you plan a study, you calculate the power for your study, you decide that you need 50 people to prove that effect, right? You know, according to your previous studies or according to, to evidence, you know, that came before. So you decide that 50 people is enough for you to prove it. And then all of a sudden you lose 20 people, you lose 30 people. Uh, how are you going to get that effect? So Anash was great saying uh, sample size, right? So right now, right, the first clear one is you diminish your sample size. And then with that, there's some consequences of diminishing the sample size, which is, for example, the imbalance, right? So if you randomize in the beginning, you get 25 people to one side, 25 to the other, and all of a sudden you got 15 that dropped, but they're all included in one group uh, by coincidence. So then uh, it's hard to compare 10 people with, you know, 25 people. There's, there's going to be a, a, um, a problem with that. And if there is a problem with that, the, the results are not going to be precise, just like Anosh also said. So one thing leads to, to the other. Uh, do you understand? So the, the sample size is a problem. It becomes in balance. The, the the results are not good, or you can't really trust the results, and and this is the whole thing is a it's a whole bias uh, um, in the study, uh, and what we're trying to do with clinical trials is all, always trying to minimize bias. And now you have a big problem that you can't do anything about, or you have to think about what's the best way to go, and then um, and then the, the the idea of less power, right? So all of the all of those things, um, Anosh said very, very well. Um, can you think about any other thing? Um, I feel that this is pretty much the problem, and I want you to understand that more than anything, or more than memorizing uh, other things. Like this is the problem. It's like if you lose, this is the problem. Is that clear for everybody? I think so, right? So, and why do we have missing data? Uh, the, the so why do we have missing data? So why why data is missing? 
can someone uh, just, you know, again, open, there's no wrong answer. What's, what's, uh, why do you think there's missing data? So I'm looking at the Excel sheet and there's not a number there. Why, why that can happen? Can you give me examples of missing data? Because I feel that if we try to find out reasons, we can try to find how can we control. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Hi, Kong Xie Li. Hey, hey, yeah. Uh, I think they have uh, several reasons. Uh, why is a uh, uh, participant drop out or or withdraw with from the study before it uh, complication? And uh, and the two I think is uh, uh, participant refused to assign assign the treatment after uh, a so a low location. And the three is participant. Uh, do not attend to uh, attend an uh, appointment, and and uh, four is uh, uh, participate attend to appointment but not to not to provide uh, relevant data. Uh, five is participates fail to complete its diet or questions, and. And uh, I and 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 the others is uh, uh, our 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 research lost the 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 data the data just like uh, uh, someone have uh, uh, years and uh, they don't have uh, enough time to to collect the data. Uh, that's all. Yep. Perfect. Um, that's great. Um, very complete answer. Anyone want to add anything? Like a reason so, why we need data? Yeah, there could be loss of data. There could be equipment failure. Uh, patients dropped out because of uh, death or moving out. Uh, poor relationship with the research uh, personnel and they, they, they become non-compliant or they developed some adverse effects because of uh, medications or uh, intervention and uh, they dropped out. Perfect. Or uh, they, um, um, the duration of trial is too long and uh, they don't want to participate. Great. So just to, just to um, I want you guys to try to notice that um, both uh, the Anash and uh, Kuning that just said I feel that there's like two component, two separate components of missing data. One that may be related to the study, right? Study design or study intervention. And, 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 and the other is like things that you can't control. And, uh, and just to give you, you know, examples of what you guys just, just talked about. For example, sometimes uh, the patient refuses uh, to, to do a questionnaire. He reads the question and say, I don't want to answer that question. And and I think there's someone with the open mic. You want to say something? Okay, sorry. If you want to say something, just open a mic and, and you can you can say my name or say, excuse me, okay? Um, so like I said, things that we can't control and things related to the study. Um, things that we can control, patient refuses, patient doesn't show up because, I don't know, because he's just not feeling like he wants to go today or, I don't know, you know, something happened in his house. Uh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, I'll give you an example uh, so you try, can try to relate with a real uh, story. I, I collect data all the time here for Dr. Fragney's lab, and there was a time that um, we, we have a a study that was going on that we had a long evaluation session that we would collect a lot of data, uh, questionnaires, uh, movement uh, uh, recording and things like that, uh, EEG. So you imagine that it was a long session, like a three hour session collecting data. There was one point at the visit that the patient just told me that she didn't want to complete, she, she wanted to go. She was tired of being there, she was tired of collecting all the data. Um, and, and she was just like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be here anymore. And, you know, I tried to explain a little bit, but it was a no, no deal. So I, of course I had to let her go. And what I did, you, you just write down, make notes that, you know, patient had to leave because of personal reasons or didn't want to stay. 
And because of that, I, there was questionnaires that were not completed. Uh, there was a lot of things that were not completed. And that was nothing related. Um, like it was, it was she, she didn't want to do that. And that was an example of, I think Anosh mentioned, sometimes the protocol is too long. And then uh, she decided to not do that just because it was too long. So maybe I should have think, I should have thought before that if I do a session too long, I have a, you know, people may, may refuse to complete the session. So this is something that maybe I could have control uh, in the beginning by designing the study a little bit better. Um, if someone gets a cold and doesn't show up, I can't do anything about that, right? Like, you know, they will call and say, I'm not showing up today. So they will miss that visit. So they will miss that data collections visit. So I can't do anything about it. Um, so, and I think, when when it becomes a problem like when like if someone misses a visit what, what is what is best if someone misses a visit because they are you know just just got a, a common cold or if they miss a visit because of uh, for example what i just said um like the session was too long and a patient didn't want to complete the session which which one do you think it's worse not worse but which one is better, I would say. I think the common cold one could be better because it's not uh, related to our protocol, neither the, the, this, this, you know, the study content, it's just uh, happened at random. Yes, because then you have something in your study that it's uh, preventing you for getting the data, which is, for example, the long session. Um, and, and that's when you have to start uh, thinking. So that's why, I mean, the, 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 before you start the study is the most important part because that's when you think about everything you're gonna do in the study. So you, you can collect everything and design the best, like think about all the variables you wanna collect, but you have to make it feasible. You have to make it in this example, for, for example, right? And, and yes, you're right. If it's related to the study, then it, it, it might be a problem because you are causing that bias, uh, you know, maybe without even knowing, but you may be causing that, that, that bias. All right. And what is uh, a... Paulo, sorry, I have a question about it. For example, ahead, if, you realize, if you realize that, oh, okay, the problem is because the section is too long. Uh, in the middle of the study, could, can we do something about it? For example, it's better what is better for the patient? Go to times one hour, one hour and a half, one hour and a half, or we need to keep with the, or it depends of what we are doing. Like, there is some a, way to fix this problem, or no? A, yeah, In the middle great, of the study. Great question, Maya. Great question. Anybody want to try to answer that before I start talking? <laughs> Anybody? Hi, yes, Paulo. This is Carla from Brazil. I think, hey, Mariana, that it, uh, if you're going to change something like that, that the procedure is going to be divided in two days, you have to write an amendment to the protocol. Yes, yes, Carla, also, you were right. And I, I just wanted to add that, uh, like, the example you gave of a patient with a cold, I think that um, at least in the bigger trials, uh, we have what they call a protocol window where let's say the visit is supposed to be three months after three months from randomization, uh, the design should have a window that allows a few days before, a few days later, or a week before, a week after, so that the patient doesn't have to come exactly on that day. Yes, that's a good point. So the first question, uh, Mariana, yes, you can do something about it, uh, but it's just not that simple about like, let's break down this and do it. Uh, so when you submitted the study, you that study was approved um, uh, by ethical committees and, and just to guarantee that it's safe for, this, for the patient and everything as you guys know. So you have to let them know that you're planning to 
break down the session and they will analyze. So you submit an amendment and they will approve that amendment and they will check if that's not going to be, you know, a burden for the patient, for example, or, you know, how you're going to do this and they're going to approve and then you can plan on how you do that. Uh, you can also maybe uh, um, try to eliminate some of the data collection you're doing. Uh, let's say, because when you do the study, you always have like one specific aim, like one main outcome, right? So, and I know when we do studies, we try to collect a bunch of variables because we want to try to, um, you know, if we think about any covariance before, we want to collect that. Um, and we want to take advantage of a bigger study and collect more data so we can kind of do other pilot study, you know, pilot things inside that study. Um, so you can, um, so you, you may be able, like if you really want to finish the study, you might be able to um, eliminate some of those secondary outcomes and just focus on the main outcome, you know, if you're really having problems. Um, I've seen that happen, like people eliminating a few uh, uh, um, uh, assessments to make the, like the, the visit short or something like that. Um, since it was like a secondary, uh, you know, not even a secondary outcome, it was, it was something that they were just collecting to have it. Um, and what Carla said is right. So the common code, for example, uh, if the person has a code and we have like the one month follow up, uh, it, it doesn't really have to, there's always the window. You can pick them like in, inside a two window range for, 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 for uh, example. So you can, um, so if they have a code that lasts for two weeks, uh, you might miss that window, but, um, you might still be able to get that patient just like if something happened and his car broke and he couldn't come for the evaluation that day there might be you know a chance because of that window that you can just catch him in the other day uh, or something like that this is true okay can i can i say something uh, we, uh, we are doing uh, clinical trials in uh, one of the studies here uh, in the hospital and uh, people have to come from different parts of the country and um, so we have to make sure that uh, during the visit, their labs are uh, checked before we administer the intervention. And uh, sometimes there are some uh, lab errors or lab personnel not available or uh, it's taking long. So they, that visit, uh, instead of one day, sometimes it becomes two days. And as long as uh, we discuss with the medical monitor and they think it is within the protocol permits, uh, it is permissible within the protocol. Uh, they they allow that, so we'll ask them to we'll put them in a hotel and they'll come back the next day and get the intervention and mm -hmm. go back. Yeah, that's right. So if you think you have a, a session that will be too long, or if you think your design, your protocol, um, you know, may change like like you just said, you can plan for that for sure. You can you can write the protocol in a way that it would allow uh, that you know that 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 um, flexibility without you having to submit an amendment, for example, just for them to come the other day, or, you know, you wouldn't miss the patient because of that. Uh, so if you, so that's the, that's the idea of uh, thinking good before the study. So if you think that's going to happen, you can plan for that and you can design a protocol in a way that that flexibility will be allowed. So that's a good point, Anash. I do, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I feel that we, uh, we have to move on. Um, um, so let's just uh, move on a little bit. So, and how much data we can miss? Uh, uh, is there a magic number, uh, a percentage of the data that we can miss? Dr. Fragni talked that, about that a little bit. Anyone want to say something? Hello, I am Amani from Qatar. Hi, Amani. Can you hear me? I can hear you well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, literature, um, there is a debate regarding um, uh, which um, limit can we, uh, we can exceed in order um, in the missed data, but uh, most of literature or papers say 5%. Uh, but um, higher than this, for example, 20% 20 20 or 30%, we cannot ignore, ignore a paper. We can, we can still... Um, uh, respect some paper that have missed data percentage of uh, 20%, but 5% um, I think will not make a huge uh, 
efficiency in in, the, in, in data. That's my answer. Yeah. Um, can I say something? Yeah, it's no bad. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, doesn't really matter about the percentage. I think that what actually really matters is that the remaining data um, still is big, in, uh, being in, big enough in order to have like some clinical relevant uh, and statistical relevant results. That's yeah. uh, maybe my thoughts. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, so yes, if, if it's 5% that you're missing, but that 5% is really making a difference on your, on your, on your um, results, then you got a problem, right? So uh, you have to do something about that. Um, and um, yeah. they, they, they have this um, regular saying about, you know, if it's up at 20%, it's okay to, to use ITT analysis. If it's above that, uh, then it's, you're probably inventing too much data. Um, and, and of course, before you think about that, you have to decide what is the mechanism and if you can really do that. But, um, but that's the idea. It, there's no really like a right or you know, wrong answer. Uh, the 20% is yeah. what people usually say that, you know, below that it's okay to use IDT. Uh, but at the same time, if you have 10% missing and that 10% is, is making a big, big difference or causing a big problem, um, then you have a problem, right? Yeah. You want to say I should say first. Yeah, I should. I should say. I should say first. Uh, there is no magic number, and I think it depends yeah. on the sample size, and it depends on a lot of criteria. So five yeah. percent can be can be huge missing in some study, and could be negligible uh, number in in other study. That's the idea. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so there's things on how to avoid, right? So we can avoid that before, during, and after the study. And it, and the idea is that, you know, before it's basically the study design you can change. You know, you you, you can design, you can pick a, an outcome that will be, um, you know, easier for you to um, uh, try to avoid dropouts, for example. If you have an outcome that you're trying to focus and that outcome is very complicated or very difficult on doing, and patients have a burden on doing that, they might not choose to do the study or they might drop out just because, uh, because of the procedure itself. Um, you can do things on the, on the study design, you can guarantee the blinding and things like that. So things related to, this, to the design, you can try to do that uh, before the study. We have discussions in the lab about that all the time. Uh, when we're planning studies over here and planning protocols, we're always talking about um, how it's gonna be the evaluation session and if it's gonna work or not. So we're always talking about feasibility. Uh, like, oh no, the patient's gonna be here for hours, it's not gonna work. So we can try to do some other thing. Let's collect this other data because it's easier. We're always talking about that. Uh, but at the same time, we have to consider about what is it that we want to collect. Like, like we can't get out of from the study objective, right? Like we have to, to collect this, we have to measure this. So what is the best way to do that? Uh, and also the protocol of the intervention. Sometimes you have an intervention that it's like 10 days in a row, the person have to come here every day for an hour. Uh, so there's things that you have to think about it before uh, to try to avoid dropouts. Um, and, and one other issue is like, uh, if you have a, a control group, uh, you really have to think about what is, that, what is it that you wanna do in the control group, because that, that may be, um, but say that the difference may be very clear from the intervention group and whoever comes, you know, gets in the, in the, in the control group would, would, would notice that they are in a control group and they just drop out because of that, uh, like they're not getting the real intervention. So there's things you can do, for example, offer that intervention after the study, even if they, you know, if we find out that they don't, um, don't, got, don't get the, the real intervention. So things in the design. During, this is the DSMB idea, so um, data safety monitoring um, boarding, that's the idea of, of checking the data and, and during the study and make sure it's being collected and make sure you're not having problems. Uh, I think Dr. Fragging talked a little bit about that. And after we'll be, you know, looking at statistics and trying to, try to uh, find ways to deal with that uh, missing data, okay? So, I think uh, one of you, I forgot your name, so you, you mentioned well the PICO for this study, right? So for this study, um, 
um, um, you you have the the population. I'm not sure what the population was then on on that one. Was that women or just regular? I forgot. But the intervention was. It was seventy women postmenopausal. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. And then the intervention was the diet, right? The at Ed, Atkins diet. The comparison was the standard diet. The outcome was was uh, weighted one year, um, and the time was of one year, right? So what determines uh, how can you deal with missing data? And I think you guys already talked about that. Like what determines how, what we can do with the missing data? Like what do you have to think about before you start dealing with missing data? I think it depends on the mechanism. Like why do, are you missing the data? <laughs> yes, correct. So the mechanism missing data, right? So this is just an outline of the study. And the big issue of this study is that we have 40% of missing data, okay? So I know we talked about the percentage, there's no magic number, but still 40%, you're thinking that there's almost half of the patients that are not in the study. So that, that, that's really a problem, right? I wouldn't want to have 40% of missing data. Um, so those are the types of missing data, okay? So, what um, can someone take a shot at missing completely at random? Fire. Fire. <laughs> or yeah. something in the computer and nobody did the backup. The backup. I don't know. <laughs> okay, great. So what's what's the oh. idea? Is that so? This type, this type of missing data is good or bad? Just what what's the idea of the fire? I mean, it's not good to have the fire, right, inside your lab, but. <laughs> yeah, it's not good to have the fire, but uh, for this study, I think it's better, no? Yeah. It's and completely at like, random. No one is responsible for that. And uh, yes, it be yeah, equipment that, failure. That's that's the idea, Nash. Great. Um, perfect. Yeah, so there's nothing to nothing we can do to, to avoid that. And that's that's the perfect case because we, it's not related to our studies, not related to our out outcome or any of the, anything. So we didn't have any fault, like uh, a pandemic happened or something like that, right? Uh, so we couldn't, we, we didn't have, we, we, you know, the patient was dropped out because um, a pandemic started. Uh, so I, you know, I feel that this, it's golden when it's happened, right? But is it common to happen? No. No. Yes, yeah, they always, we can always try to think about a reason why it happens, right? And if you think about a reason that it happens, you know, that's probably missing at random because you can relate to something on the study. So the idea is that it's unrelated to observed and observed features and now missing at random. Who, can, who wants to take a shot? Yes, that missing is, is related with observed features, but not related with unobserved features. I believe you are putting a silver under this. You, be, you I believe you what? You, you might put a, an image of silver under this. Oh, no. No. So you said it right, perfect. Missing, um, you know, missing is, is related to observed features only. So I, 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 I you know, I, I had this example of, uh, for example, if you're doing a depression study and for some reason, um, you know, women um, are not um, comfortable answering, for example, any depression uh, scales. So then you have a missing data because they didn't answer. They're more unlikely to, to uh, answer questions about depression for whatever reason. Okay, so it's somewhat related to a demographic variable in this case, like being women or being men, for example, it could be men. I'm, I'm just giving an example here. Yes. Uh, so then you have miss, you, you have a, a data missing, be, you know, and you can relate that data missing because of one of the variables you're, you're actually collecting, for example, gender or age or, or something like that. Okay. It's related so to uh, basic characteristic of the subject. Yeah, yeah. So it can be related to the characteristics of the subject. And then missing not at random would be what? It's the worst one. Yeah. And it's related to 
to outcome itself. So it's the worst one. So how would you relate that example that I just gave, the depression one in women, to to not missing at random? Like how would that be not missing at random, for example? And anybody can talk, please. Can you repeat the question, please? So I gave the example of depressed, uh, uh, not depressed, like uh, women may not be, may be unlikely to respond depression questions. So you might have missing data because of, uh, uh, because of, you know, because they are women, uh, for example. Um, so how, how can you use that example and turn that into a non-missing, like not missing at random? Like what will be a not missing uh, at random in this um, case, I, for example, why they, why they're, why they're missing, um, why they're not uh, answering depression questions. Okay, hi, uh, this is Benan from um, uh, Doha site. Um, if, if I just mis um, understood your question right, um, in this case, if the uh, data ended up missing because of, uh, let's say, it's, um, it's related to the outcome itself. So if they became extremely um, depressed and they just drop out the study because of how they felt or like they committed suicide, they got the bits or something related to the outcome itself, and this is why it's the worst type of data, uh, missing data. Great, great. You guys are good. So yes, uh, that would be a problem. For example, if they, they are not answering depression questions because they are depressed. So then you have a problem, right? So they're, they're, it's related to the outcome directly. So um, you're doing a depression study and they're not um, answering or not coming to the visit because they are depressed. And that's that's a problem, right? So you don't you don't you can't really do anything about that. I mean, it's it's hard to deal with that type of data. I feel that you always can um, try to um, um, consider the data as being missing at random because uh, you might never know, right? How how can you check if they're depressed if they're not coming if you're not seeing that? Uh, and there's always the, this issue. Um, so the, it is it is really a problem. So for the two first ones, you know, completely at random and, and the missing at random, uh, there's things you can do. Uh, for example, the, the completely at random, you might not have to do anything and depending on the, how much data you have, you may not have to do anything, but definitely for the missing at random, there's things you can do and they call that, you know, the intention to treat analysis. Um, so you, where you, uh, where would you, you know, if someone is randomized, they're gonna, uh, they're gonna be analyzed. Okay, and this one, it's a problem. So there's two things you consider when you're dealing with the missing data. So first is how much, right? First is how much and how much that impacts your data. And also the nature, so what we just discussed, what's the mechanism of missing data? So those are two things that you have to kind of think about um, before you start um, creating this in data. Okay, so intention to treat analysis, the idea that if the patient is randomized, it's gonna be analyzed. Let's say a patient comes to your study, uh, he's randomized today, he does the first treatment, and then he goes out the door and a bus run entered him and he's died, he died. Um, that's a rough example, but uh, the idea is that uh, he was just randomized um, and, and now he can't complete all this, you know, all the study. So should you just exclude him from the study or can you do something about it? So if you're using an intention to treat analysis, uh, he's gonna be analyzed in the group that he was randomized. And there's different ways that you can try to, um, you know, complete that data that he didn't complete, okay? Um, so those are the options of um, how to do. So just to list them now, the idea is to, you can do nothing. Uh, you can do that uh, lost obs uh, last observation carried forward the main substitution and all of the others. We can talk about them, okay? Uh, and when you talk about, um, uh, there's two ways you can do, right? When you have the data, uh, you can just look at the cases that are complete. So we call that the complete case analysis. Uh, so then you would just ignore the missing data or you can use the ITT approach. And the ITT, you can, uh, there's different uh, things you can do, you can do, of single imputation methods and multiple imputation methods. We're gonna talk about that, okay? So first one is do nothing. Uh, what, what do you guys think about doing nothing? 
advantages, disadvantages, real quick? I think it's simple and you don't need to manipulate any data. So I think um, if you missing data is not to uh, maybe less than 5% and you can use this method. Um, but for a uh, small sample size, it will lead to biases and it will increase the type two error. Nice, awesome. I'm telling you, you guys are good. Yeah, it's easy, but at the same time, in this case, let's think about Dr. Strong, it's 40% of missing data, right? So if you just ignore that, just like you said, you lost power, you lose power a lot. So you got a problem on doing that. And you also mentioned about the type two error, right? That's, that's uh, you know, that's a consequence of, um, you, know, you know, losing the power. And, and, and the, the imbalance thing, it could be, you know, it could be a, a disadvantage as well, right? So, so if you just ignore and you might um, exclude, you know, that you might have patients that are missing more in one group than the other and there, there's an imbalance for sure. Okay, great. Any have any questions about this one? So usually not, not a big fan, like you shouldn't do that, right? So I feel that if you have 5% of missing data, you know, you can use the ITT anyway. It's not a problem. It's just like it's better to have data than no data. Uh, and you can always do like what they call a sensitivity analysis. You do with and without it and see if it changes too much. Um, you know, if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's making a big difference, uh, you can always do that and mention that you did that on a paper. So this is a complete case analysis example, right? So now it's the last observation carry forward. Can someone summarize that real quick? It's an assumption that uh, P and, uh, subjects will continue to do the same, even though they have dropped out. And uh, so any missing data is uh, based on the observation uh, on that uh, subject with the previous visit. Great. So you just use whatever data they have on the previous visit and you just, like they didn't change, right? So it's very easy to do that. Um, any disadvantages? Advantages Anyone? is uh, it is approved by FDA. Disadvantages is uh, what happens to the subject uh, that is going to change the characteristics as they uh, during the duration of the study. Yeah, I think the, the the main disadvantage is the assumption that it it it's based on right. So it's based on the assumption that the per person would not change. So if they got better to a certain point of the study, you would, you would make the assumption that they don't get worse. They just stay there and, and stay. And if they got worse after a little bit of the intervention and you just maintain that, it's like they're never gonna get better. So it's, it's the assumption itself. It's a limitation. Like, and, and let's think about Dr. Strong's study, uh, the idea of, uh, about what happens uh, to weight after a diet, right? So usually when you do a diet, you lose weight. And what happens when you when you stop uh, the diet right away? So you should you should get oh, weight. That, that you that you re regain the weight. Yeah, so you regain at least a little bit the weight, right? This is like the common uh, a common perception that everybody has. So if you if you do the last observation carry forward, you would assume that it's not gonna you know that patient's gonna stay there and it's not gonna. Uh, bounce back to to their body's line so then there's other things you can do so um so like i said i think that uh, the idea is that uh, the assumption itself it's a limitation depending on your outcome depending on what you're doing all right the mean substitution anybody want to talk about that a little bit oh that decreased variability should not be there but that's okay What's the mean substitution? It's, we replace the, every missing value with a group mean. It's done very easily, but uh, at the same time, it reduces largely the uh, variance or the standard, uh, standard deviation. So yes. uh, yeah, it might increase uh, type one error. Yeah, perfect. A anybody like, um, I feel that it's very clear in um, 
you said it perfectly. Um, so anybody have any questions about that? And, and the idea is that when you put a lot of the same, like if you calculate the mean of a variable and then you substitute all the missing data like equals to that mean, you're gonna, you're gonna make that variance um, diminish, right? So the variability of that data is gonna definitely uh, um, decrease. And that's the idea about what they said in the case, uh, less noise. So you're gonna have less noise, less variance. So less noise, you're able to detect more signal, right? So that's a type one arrow. Uh, decrease, uh, decrease noise, increase amplitude, and uh, basically artificially uh, decreasing that standard uh, deviation. Yes. yes, yes, perfect. Yeah, that's a very, um, um, I would say very easy way to do it. Um, I'm not sure if I like that very much, um, but um, anyway, this is information. You have to decide what is best for your study, right? How about the regression substitution? What is that about? Anyone? Nope. So you understand that the regression, um, it's, it's you creating a model using whatever variables you want to predict or to understand how those variables affect um, like your outcome variable, for, for example. You want to say something, Amani? Okay. so. So the idea of this one is um, you you have some outcome data. Let's say you have um, um, Dr. Strong example, right? So you're trying to predict um, uh, the weight, right? And then in your study, um, you have a lot of missing data. And in your study, you have variables, for example, uh, lifestyle, uh, yes or no, if the person is involved in sports, um, uh, you have the the the, the, the treatment um, uh, variable if they're doing the the the, the diet or not. Uh, you have um, uh, I don't know if the person is uh, has been obese before, yes or no. So you can use that those variables to kind of predict what's the weight it's going to be. So you do a regression model, include all those variables, and and whatever whenever you have the uh, you create the regression equation. And then you can predict. So you just do that uh, for every missing value uh, uh, for all, all of the other covariates. And then you can predict that data that it's missing. So it's just a, a better way, for example, than doing the mean. So the mean is very general. So you just get the mean of that variable and then substitute the missing data. So this one, you're using, uh, you're using variables from the study to predict the variable that you're missing. So that's, it's a more sophisticated metal, um, uh, method, but it's, it's, not that, um, it's not that hard. Um, and you use collected data to predict the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you create different values. You're not gonna create, you're not gonna do um, uh, like the mean. So you create the same value for, for all the missing data. So you're gonna create different values that according to do that. So it's a little bit better on the variance. So it's gonna, it's not gonna, uh, diminish the, the standard deviation as much, but still uh, diminishes a little bit uh, because you're using that data from the study. So mm -hmm. the disadvantage will be more advanced statistics and you may take time to estimate the best model, like which model you're gonna use to predict your outcome. So you have to think about it. What are the variables that you're gonna include? You can, be, you can use like a statistics uh, rationale or you can use more of a uh, biological theoretically um, uh, rationale about which variable you're going to include in a model uh, and like I said still decreases the, the standard deviation a little bit anybody want to say something Paulo I have a question go ahead Udo okay I have a practical question regarding the regression impute, uh, imputation um, and when reading the literature the literature says okay you have to uh, let's say to substitute the missing data with fitting values with fitting data 
what does this mean? Because when I when I'm running a corresponding regression, we see independent variables. Okay, I I receive the the, the known output, but uh, what to do? Is the, do I take the coefficients for the respective um, uh, um, uh, independent variables? Uh, are these the fitting values? This is uh, yeah. what, what, what I didn't understand. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. It's a very <laughs> fair question, Udo. And I think everybody um, um, sometimes confused about the idea of what is a model. You know, what are you talking about model, and what what are you talking about when you're talking about fitting uh, data into a model? It, it is it is weird sometimes. It take you maybe a little bit for you to get used to. It. So what are you trying to do? You have to think about in this break it down to the simple thing. Um, so you, when you're looking at studies, when you're doing research, always when you, what you're trying to do is see the relationship between one thing with the other, right? So you have two variables you're trying to uh, determine the relationship or, or three variables you're trying to determine the relationship with that outcome variable, like how, uh, how my lifestyle and my, uh, I don't know, my level of depression influences my weight. For example, how how those three variables are associated together. So, you, what you can do to do that is uh, there's different ways you can do it. And one one way you can do it, you can look at you can try to create a model that will explain how those variables are associated. Or in other words, you can try to create a model, and the model will tell you how those two variables right here are are moving, and 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 when they move, what happens to this other one that you know the outcome variable so the model will tell you that so uh, so you get a data you get a lot of uh, 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 data points and then you look at the data and you can see if you can try to fit that data into a model so you can what you, what you're trying to say there is that you you look at the data and you're trying to see if you if there's a pattern if there is a logic way uh, uh, that that those um, uh, variables are happening together that they are related uh, to, to each other uh, so you try to fit a model into that and when we say a linear regression you're trying to fit a linear model so a linear model will be you know those like I have two variables that are related this way so if one if one if variable a goes up the other way goes up, the other variable also goes up for example so if my uh, level of uh, exercises goes up uh, so if I do a lot of exercises, um, my weight uh, it's going it's going to go down likely. For example, so that's a that's a negative re um, 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 relationship. So you're trying to see if there's a linear relationship between the models. Um, let me try to give you an example here with the next slide. So this is an example that I created uh, for the for one of the the, the um, data sets that I gave to you. So I I I I thought about this um, um, Outcome, uh, outcome uh, about uh, a, a mother's uh, depression level, right? And now, uh, so we're collecting mother's depression levels on a scale from zero to 10. Uh, zero is no depressed at all. 10 is very, very depressed. And I have some variables that I want to see, you know, how they influence a mom's depression level. And the variables I have is, for example, how, how well the house is organized every day and how, uh, how happy uh, the son of the mom is happy, uh, how happy they are. So for example, in a zero to 10 scale. So if, we, if the son is like happy all the time, a 10, you know, there's more likely that the, uh, you know, the mom is not gonna be so depressed. Uh, so I'm just thinking about variables that can influence the mom depression level. The husband's support level, right? So the husband's support level, uh, if the husband supports a lot, uh, you know, mom is not gonna be depressed so much. Uh, and I have a variable that doesn't have anything related to it. So if the mom eats tapioca, I, and I had, and that's a categorical variable, yes or no. Okay, so if I run a model, um, I can determine, so this is an example of the data set, for example, okay? So I have here, uh, um, oh, I forgot to include here, there's, there's another variable that I included, it's called like sun school problem, so how much, problems my uh, the son is having at the school or my son is having at the school okay so if i'm at zero to ten again if i'm if i'm ten for example this guy here number six is eight uh so he's eight 
Um, so that means that they are having a lot of problems at the school. Okay, so uh, let's look at this example. The first one, for example, this, this kid is not having any problems at the school. The house organization is 10, it's always organized. The son is happy all the time and the husband is supporting all the time uh, and, the mom, and the mom doesn't eat tapioca. Um, and, and that's, again, not, nothing related to that. But the, uh, the mom depression level here, uh, in this case, is missing data. Uh, but what would you would expect that that would be, you know, a, a low level of depression, right? Because all of them, you know, everything is good uh, for that mom. So you, you, uh, you can look at that data and you can plot. And what I did in the, in, the, in the data set, for example, run a regression. So when you run a regression, you get the coefficients. So you get the, you get the idea of how those variables move. Uh, and and what and when they move, what happened with mom's depression? So that's what the coefficients on the model would tell you. For example, I'll get I'll grab an example here. Son happy, okay? So son is happy, and this is a negative coefficient. So a negative coefficient means that when this one goes up, this one goes down, okay? So if the son is happy, mom is less depressed, okay? And on, uh, it's, it's in this case, uh, for and this is a, a 1 to 10 scale, so this is just an example, right? So how much the sun is happy, 1 to 10, uh, you know, 0 to 10, 0 no happy, 10 very happy, and mom depressed, depressed also 0 to 10. So if the sun is happy, um, you know, for every unit increase in how much the sun is happy, I have a decrease of 0.33 uh, of the mom depression level. So I'm trying to fit, um, so now I got a model. I can write the regression equation like this, for example. This, these are the coefficients, right? So this is just the column that I created. So what I do, I put the, the constant, right? So the constant is this number right here, plus, and then I put all those variables, like all the values that I'm doing this. So for example, the sun school problem times the coefficient. So this will be this coefficient right here. So this one, A2, with the coefficient of sun school 0 0.14. So this is 0 0.14 right here. So, and then you keep adding that. And those variables here will give you an estimate of how much, uh, like it will predict this uh, mom depression level right here. Okay, so according to how the data is, you know, how the data is uh, it's related on this one. So this is an example of the, the regression substitution. I'm using a regression. I'm using uh, variables from the data to predict what the one that I'm missing right here. Okay. So I don't know if I answer your question, but the idea is that you you fit a model. You're trying to fit. Um, you're trying to understand how how the various variables that you're investing, like some of the variables, the covariates you have, uh, how they relate to the outcome. So the, the, the model is kind of giving you that, that equation, like, you know, in this case, you know, all of those, um, uh, you can actually see the result here. So you can see that uh, uh, the husband's support is probably the strongest variable. Like the son is happy, he's not significant here. The house organization is not significant in this model. The problems at son's school, it's not significant. But when you put husband's support, uh, it's very significant. So it seems that husband support is having a very big impact on, on mom depression level. And you can see that it's the largest coefficient. So indeed, it looks like husband support. So you can use that model, but uh, again, you can create the model in any way you want to kind of determine the missing data. Uh, so you can, you know, some would argue that you don't include uh, variables that are not significant in the model. But again, you're just trying to create a model to try to predict the missing data. So you can, you can think about that statistically, you can think about that uh, theoretically, if you think those variables uh, are important then you should include in the model to, to add to the prediction. Um, so you can do that, okay? Paulo, Paulo that, uh, does it mean that in the case you described that we uh, could take, uh, let's say for all missing data, uh, the, the best value uh, we think uh, this would be the best, for example, this value with the best p-value. This is what I did, uh, didn't 
understand. I understand the model, I understand the, the idea behind it, but uh, let's say uh, looking to the coefficients, uh, you said it before, that this uh, specific coefficient with this very, very good p-value does contribute uh, to the MEMS, uh, uh, let's say, mood the best. Does this mean, again, my question, that to substitute the missing values only by this coefficient? Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's yeah, a good question. <laughs> I think, yeah, no, do you want to finish? No, no, that's the, the, the rough idea because um, uh, this, I, I do understand, and if this is the best value uh, of this four coefficient uh, uh, regarding the other independent variables, I, I would log logically wise take this only for yeah. all missing yeah. data. But please correct that's me. A, that's a perfect rationale, you know. So you're thinking about why should I bother with the other variables if there, are, if I have one variable that it's pro that it's the best one? It's 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 giving them more, you know, it's more significant in the model. So that's true. You can you can uh, you can uh, think about that, but like I said, if you're trying to just uh, create uh, missing data um, and you're trying to develop a model, and uh, that's one of the like the, what I put there as a disadvantage because um, you're gonna have to decide the best model, and to decide the best model, uh, you may consider other things. For example, if you and I uh, start a discussion, you might think that. Um, yeah, hey Paulo, you know I don't think Sun School's problem it's a it's a big deal. So I don't think that could influence a mom's depression level. So I don't want to include that in a model because I don't think it's going to make any difference. And also when I put in the model, it's not significant anyway. So I'm not going to do it. But I can think wrong. I can say you know uh, you know I do think it's a problem. I want to include that uh, because that I want to consider that when I'm doing my model uh, for prediction. Uh, even though it's not significant in the model. So I can force that in the model and just leave that in the model uh, just to make sure I, I consider that when I'm creating the missing data. So there's different opinions. You can use that statistical mindset of, okay, this is not significant, so I'm not gonna put it, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you're trying to de decide like a best model of prediction or things like that, then I think it's good for you to use that uh, statistical mindset of, you know, if it's not significant, because the, the, if you can predict something with one variable, why you include the others, right? So it, it is better. But in this case that you're constructing missing data, I, I think there's no problem and you can try to force some other variable in the model, even if it's not significant, to predict the missing data. Um, so so there's, there's the dilemma of doing the regression. It's uh, how to decide the best model to complete the missing data. So I feel that it's a good way to do it uh, you can, you can, you know, you're going to use variables from the study to predict the outcome. Um, you can pick the variables that you think can influence more. Uh, but the issue is, um, you know, if I build a model and you build a model, we're probably going to have a different model. And which one is the best? I, you know, there's no, there's no, you can argue for yours. I can argue for mine. And, and that's the issue about, I can pick the model that best suits for me, uh, for example. Or I can, no, this, I can is, do this, is, this is what I meant that let's say within one model regression imputation there this is very inconsistent because uh, depending on your subjective uh, progressing or idea mm -hmm. or looking to the to the final results I think uh, the researcher is steering uh, let's say you see missing data uh, problem and so far it is uh, it is uh, difficult to uh, to let's say to be regarded objectively, in in my opinion. Therefore, I yep. took this example with the best well, with the best p-value uh, coefficient here, and yep. I took uh, this coefficient uh, in all the missing data, and then I say, okay, this is my model. <laughs> okay, yep. it sounds logic, but uh, maybe not the best. Yeah. yeah okay. No, thank you. Uh... Thank I you, understand Paul. completely. Yeah, I understand completely what you're saying, and and you know you're right. You're right. The way you're thinking, it's right. Um, there's nothing wrong with the way you're thinking. That's that's what I'm saying. So, pa Paul, can it. I ask one question? Go ahead. So, Mike. yeah. So from what I'm seeing so far, uh, this is predicted based on uh, the p-value and the coefficient, 
and uh, regression uh, coefficients that you're seeing. So, and uh, so uh, to answer the previous um, um, uh, student's question, is it, a, uh, is it within a range that is acceptable uh, to put these missing values or uh, it could be anything? How can you, so if there are two missing values, is that missing value will be the same or will it differ? No, it would differ because uh, uh, take a look at the screen and look at the, the Excel, for example. So to predict this first one, okay, so to predict this first value right here, like this is a variable that I created called mom depression uh, regression, predicted by re the regression. Um, so for this one, the formula is the constant, right, that I found on the model right here. And then I, I will consider this value that I have, the sun schools problem, and times the, the, the coefficient of this variable. And then I would add the house organization value that I have for this, for this person times this coefficient. So everybody has a different one here. So when I put that into the formula, I would have different uh, values. And this is actually the values that I created. So you can see that for this person right here, it's predicting a value of 10. So a value of 10 is a mom very depressed. So let's see if it makes sense. So a mom very depressed on this number two. So let's see what they have. So she's having seven on school problems. The house is organized, um, um, not too much. Uh, son is zero, it's not happy at all. And husband is not supporting at all, zero. So it kind of makes sense. So he predicted a high level of depression, okay? So he predicted a 10. Uh, let's see, but let's see, the problem is like, this is a real data, right? We're not missing the number six here. So let's see if we do a prediction on this one, if it will give me a six. And when I did, it gave me a three. You see the problem with that? So it might not be, um, um, you know, the case. So you might predict and you might be biased a little bit. You, un you, un you understand? Did you see that? So it's gonna it's gonna create different values. It's not gonna be the same because you're using different data points from from each uh, each participant. I see. A little, a little better. A little. <laughs> I think the, the concept of regression, um, it's, a, uh, it's a big challenge for um, people that um, are seeing this uh, for, you know, um, for the first time in PPCR or have not seen too much about this. Uh, but the idea is that I, I want you to try to just remember that I'm trying to predict something with the information I have. Um, um, for example, and I'll, I'll try to give an example. Um, I see patients here uh, and they're very, um, they have a very unique um, uh, characteristic. You know, some of them are very happy, positive, some of them are not as much. And I notice myself that uh, the positives, they have a certain uh, um, uh, outcome in the study. And the negatives, they have another outcome in the study. Uh, of course, I'll be blind, but I'm just I'm just uh, giving an example. So the idea is that I'm going to use the variables that I have, for example, knowing that they are positive or knowing that they're not very positive to predict the outcome. Let's say one drop out, I'll say, oh, that guy was, was a little depressed, so he's likely going to be this way. So, I mean, this is a general uh, idea of like you're using data that you have to predict something that you don't have. So to do that, you create a model to see uh, what's the equation that it's going to be. So this is the equation in the end, like mom depression level will be equals to the equation where you're using all those uh, variables that you know. Um, I'm not sure if that helped a little bit, but you can see that it, you know, I predicted the values uh, that were missing here using a depression, uh, a model that I created. And again, the problem can be what is the best model, right? Thank you. Okay, guys, let's move on uh, just to make sure we don't lose. There's there's one way called a stochastic regression substitution, which is the same thing as regression. However, you add a little error, right? So there's a, um, the way you calculate the standard error and the regression, uh, this other 
uh, way, it would just consider a little bit more error because you, since you're predicting, um, you want to make sure it's it's like a, it's it's a little bit more conservative. It's not gonna. Uh, um, uh, it's just a little better than the regression. Just adds a little error, just for you to guys to know. Uh, but that's more, um, you know, advanced statistics. You would a little, you use a little uh, uh, thing, but it's a little better than just using a regular regression. Okay. The worst case scenario, I think it's pretty straightforward, right? So, um, for example, the patient starts. In case of Doctor Doctor Strong, the patient starts at a certain level. And they, uh, once they start the diet, they actually um, uh, gain weight a little bit, and then they started to go down, and then they drop out. So what you can, uh, uh, um, how you can substitute, you just get that worst level that they were, they were like uh, in the beginning when they gained some weight a little bit. So you just uh, um, assuming that they're gonna uh, gain weight again and stay that way. Um, so that, that's like the worst case scenario. So you have to think about if this is appropriate for your study or not, if this is likely to happen. So it's very easy. And the problem is that the, the, a good thing is that if you can prove the effect, assuming the worst case scenario, it, it's probably, it probably has a good effect, right? Because uh, if you're assuming the worst case and you're still seeing a signal, um, you know, if, if the patients were there, were not missing, you would probably get an even better signal. Uh, because you would probably get patients that would get better and not worse because you're assuming everybody's going to get worse. So it's good if you still get the results, but if you don't get the results, you can't say that it's, uh, you know, you can't say it's true. So it's a little conservative because you're, you, you're just assuming the worst case scenario, but it might be too conservative, right? So you might not see uh, the effect just because you assume that everybody was going to be, um, be worse, okay? And again, you have 40% of missing data in this, in this one. Baseline carry forward, you just use the, the level of baseline that they were. So you just look at the weight that they were at baseline and just move forward with that uh, if they missed, okay? I think those are pretty straightforward. Do you guys have any questions on those? Yeah, so the disadvantage is you underestimate the effect uh, because, you know, the variable won't change, the baseline uh, won't change, so you just keep that doing. Uh, so you have a little bias towards the no, because because at the beginning of the, of the study, the idea is that they don't have any difference, right? So if you if you keep, you know, if you, com if you uh, copy that uh, baseline uh, value for all the rest of the study, you have that bias towards the no. And there's two other methods that uh, I would like to talk about real quick. So one is the multiple imputation and the mass maximum likelihood. So the multiple imputation uh, strategy, uh, you can actually do multiple imputation uh, for all of the, the, the um, for some of the strategies that we just talked about. So for example, what do you do on multiple imputation is like, uh, remember when I was talking about the regression, you get the, you know, you get the, the values from that you have to predict the other, uh, you would do the same thing, but you would get just a portion of the, that population. So let's say Dr. Strong has, uh, well, he had 70 people from the study and uh, he was missing 40%. So I don't know how much he had, but uh, let's say you have 100, 100 people in the study and you lose 40%. Uh, so now you want to predict that 40%. Uh, you can do uh, like that. I'm going to get... Uh, 50 people from the study and, and calculate a regression model on that, okay? And then I get, uh, um, you know, I do the prediction and I get a value. So then I'm going to put that 50 back and I'm going to grab 50 more. So of course, I'm going to have overlap of the same 50, but I'm, I'm just going to grab another portion of the study. And then I'll do the regression based on that population and I get a result. And then I'll keep doing that, like different samples from the study. And then when I get the result, I, I'm gonna get the results and average them. So I'm gonna uh, just um, you know, get the results and average them. And that's the one I'm gonna use it to do, um, to do the, the substitution. Uh, like for example, the mean. You know, I get the mean from that 50 people 
and, and just write down somewhere. And then I go to the other, you know, put it back and get grab more 50 and I get the mean of that. And then I put it back, grab more 50 and I just make a note again. And then I get all those means and calculate a mean of those means. And, and that will be my, my, you know, the data that I'm gonna substitute. So this is a great way to do it. Uh, so again, the only thing is that it uh, requires a little more um, um, advanced statistics, uh, like bootstrapping techniques, uh, that it's not hard to learn. Um, you know, it's, it's basically coding and you can, you can try to learn, but the, I want you to get the idea, the multiple imputation, you get portions of the population to, to use to calculate, for example, the mean, and then, and, and then you average the mean. So you, you have multiple imputations to, to calculate that, uh, that final missing value. How many how many such sets should we do in so in the in the paper it says three to ten sets so what is ideal so great question Anosh and that really um, there's no right or wrong answer to that um, it depends on how much you think it's appropriate some people would do like a thousand samples of that sample uh, but if you have a, a sample with uh, you know seventy people or I don't know thirty people. Uh, it's probably not going to change much, right? The, so the mean. Uh, so you really have to think about it uh, and decide it for yourself. And the statistician can help you think about that. But, um, you know, in this case, Dr. Strong, three to 10 times, uh, it's probably a good, uh, a, good, uh, a good number. But let's say you have a, a bigger data set, uh, you might want to do more, uh, more samples because you want to make sure you, you grab like a good, you know, a good amount of the samples of the population to, to do the multiple interpretation. Uh, so really, uh, it really depends, really uh, how much, depends on how much people you have. Um, but I would say, you know, at least, um, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, and again, it really depends on the size of your sample, but I'm thinking at least 10. Uh, I did one time, uh, I used this one time, and we did with, um, like uh, state ahead a, a, a default method that would do 20 times. Uh, and I did for uh, a thousand times just to test. And, and, and then my, my p-value was actually getting a little shorter. Uh, anyway, so you have to decide on your own how, much, how, mu how many samples you have. But it has to have a, a, a bit of a reason for when you do that. Paolo, can, can I ask a question on that, please? I get, I get the process like for the mean, uh, like you, mm -hmm. you get the mean from the means and you can do the same thing for the, the regression too. Like you, ha you can do a regression from the regressions. Yes, yeah, so for example, you calculate the, you get a sample of the population, you, you, you calculate a regression model. So you get a regression model. Um, and you predict the values, okay? Then you put that population back, grab more 50, and you do the same thing. So now you get two values, right? Yeah. So, and then, so you can do those, so you can, uh, for example, do the mean of those, of those two values that you calculated, like the, the results of the regression, for example, okay? So this, this will be a way. Um, yeah, yeah great. I mean, there's no, there's no way that like to, you would do like a, a me, uh, regression of the results that, that you can't do that. So you just calculate different equations and see what you get. And then you can, I don't know, do the average of what you get. This will be a, oh. little, uh, a little bit better. You understand a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it now. Yeah, thank you. So advanced method, a little bit more complicated. So let's go to the tapioca. Um, data set. Uh, and this is just a summary, guys. I like to think this way. So completely at random, uh, we know uh, the data are missing by chance. Any method will work if you do that. Even if you drop out, you ignore, or if you do any other thing, it would work, all right? Again, it depends on also on the amount of data you have, right? So you're not gonna just ignore if it's a lot of uh, data missing. 
the missing at random, we know and have measured the reason data are missing. And, um, you know, multiple imputations methods are more appropriate in this case, uh, but any other methods that we talked about are appropriate as well or accepted. Okay, so this is the example of the depressed uh, mom uh, or the, the women that are likely to not respond to depression questions. Okay, and uh, the missing not at random, uh, we have not measured the reason data are missing, nothing would work. Okay, so that's a problem. Uh, let's say the they are not responding to depression questions because they are depressed. Okay. Can you open the um, can you open the um, tapioca? Um, the, the tapioca um, data sets, do you guys have it? Is in Google, uh, yes, is in Google our, oh my God. Yeah. The same. Well, I'm um, just thinking here. Um, I know this was probably going to happen. Like, the, um, I just want to talk about the covariate adjustment a little bit before we do that. And if you guys have time, I can stay a little bit to work on the, on the exercises. Um, whoever wants to leave or have to leave, you can leave. But if not, um, you know, I'll be here. I can stay here more. But I want to talk about the covariate. Do you guys understand the idea of covariate adjustment? Um, Dr. Frank, you talked about that. So why do we do covariate adjustments? Can anybody say anything? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, covariate basically is a, a factor that is going to uh, somehow interact with the um, variables that we're measuring or working with. Yes, perfect. And you might want to sometimes control that, right? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, if we want to maybe assess the, the power of an uh, antidepressant, and we know that probably younger people were, uh, will uh, react better to the treatment. Maybe we want to randomize and control those covariates in order to, as example, the the cage of the age. Perfect. Yes, perfect. That's it. Uh, very clear. So this is that sort of the same example. So how much a mom has said, um, you know, and there's other like the, there's covariates that relate to that. So the house organization has a relationship with how mom is said. The dead support has also a relationship. But also the dead support has um, um, also maybe our uh, uh, influence on house organization. So if the dad is not supporting, he's not cleaning the house too much. If the house is not organized, mom is even said. And then also that support also can influence the mom. Um, and how much a baby smiling um, um, can influence how mom, how the mom is said. Um, and how do you think about all those covariates? You know, how, why do you want to, uh, do that, um, why do you want to think about that? Uh, like, why do you think about those specific covariates? How do you define a covariate? Uh, and you, you can only think about that if you, you know, if you go ahead and study about it. So like you said, the example, you know, age may be influenced because you read that somewhere, you, you saw that research, so you want, to, you want to definitely co collect that covariate, so you want to call, um, uh, control for it later. So you might, you might find out that some covariates can influence a variable without thinking before, uh, but you should think about all of that when you're uh, planning your study. Okay. All right, and then just an example why we should consider covariate adjustment. Uh, for example, um, in this example here, um, how much a baby smiles, uh, it's influenced how mom, how, how it's influencing how, mom, how, how sad the mom is. And uh, for example, the house organization, the dad support has nothing to do with the baby smiling. Okay, so there's a direct relationship here between how much a baby smiles and how much a mom is sad. 
and nothing, nothing seems to be influenced on that, okay? However, the house organization and the debt support covariate, uh, they might be working together to have an effect on mom. So you might wanna control for some of them. Like if I really un wanna understand how much uh, debt support is influenced, how, mu how much the, of the mom is said, I have to take into account the house organization. I have to kind of put that in the model or consider that so I can really understand just this error right here. Because I know if I, because debt support has also an influence on how, how, how much the house organized and how much the house organized has an influence on mom. So I wanna take that out of the equation so I, I wanna understand just how much that supports. So this is a, so then I would have to uh, adjust for this covariate when I'm doing my model or when I'm looking at my statistics. I wanna consider that so I can understand just that. So I wanna control for that covariate, okay? Because this covariate can have an influence on this one as well. Okay, now we can go see. So we have to define uh, what are prognostic and non-prognostic variables, right? Yes, when you design your study, you should think about that, like all the covariates you want to include. So I think it's better if I show, can you see my screen, my status screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, we can see. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize the variables here. Okay, so um, let me know if you have any questions. So I'm just I'm just summarizing everything I need. Uh, I have um, um, a mom depression level at the first follow up. Okay, so let's say it's a six months follow up. The son schools problems. Okay, so I have. For, uh, so the month, you see the follow-up has 29 observations. So there's a lot of missing values here, okay? It's a scale from zero to 10, okay? This is the mean standard deviation. The sun school problem, I have 40 observations. So the mean standard deviations, it's a zero to 10 again. So sun schools, 10 is a, a very, you know, there's a lot of problems at the school and zero, no problem. House organization, 40 variables, zero to 10 scale, same thing. How much a son is happy, zero to 10, 40 observations. And then there's this variable about if the mom eats tapioca or not. Or not. Uh, this is a yes or no uh, variable, okay? And there's also an age group for mom, and there's a mom depression baseline level. So I wanna um, do just just this so you can, sh you can appreciate the difference between you know, having a data with missing values or not having missing values, okay? So I'm gonna just t-test the difference between a mom depression level. Uh, I have also the, uh, so I have the, the first follow-up, which is missing, okay? Uh, there's, there's, there's the missing data, but I have the complete, uh, uh, complete follow-up as well. Just, just to because this is a data set for us to study. So I have the complete follow up with 40 uh, variables. So I'm just gonna show like, if the mom eats tapioca and if the mom doesn't eat tapioca, uh, what's the di what's the difference on the depression level, right? Are they are those groups different? So I'm just gonna run a t test. Um, oops. To do that, hold on. Yeah, this will be the variable. Okay. So this is the full data set, uh, 40, 40 patients. Uh, I'm looking at it here. And what do, you, what do you guys can tell me? So this, they don't eat tapioca, 19 moms, and 21 eat tapioca. What do you can tell me about this? Are they different, the groups? In, in the in the depression levels? No. no. No, right? And you wouldn't expect to, right? So, I mean, why eating tapioca or not would make a difference if the mom is depressed or not, right? So this makes sense. It's not, there's no difference between the groups, all right? So now I'm gonna use the data set, uh, the, the variable that has the missing data, okay? So it's, the, it's just the same variable, but I deleted some of the variables, some of the variables some of the observations. So this is the one, 
right here. So I'm going to run a t-test, um, just ignoring the missing data. Look at the results. So now I see there's only 29. Okay, the groups is still a little balanced, you know, but I see the difference. So moms that um, don't eat tapioca, they're more depressed. And moms that eat tapioca are less depressed. So does that mean that tapioca, it's a big depression treatment? I mean, the idea is that I wanna show you that how can you mislead your results if you ignore the missing data? Can you guys uh, see the example I'm giving? Yes, yes that, we can. Is, it's is that clear? Yeah, it's yeah, clear, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. So yeah. this is a, 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 a useless variable, but you're now seeing a, a relationship that you're, you're misleading. You're thinking that there is a difference between the groups, but to be honest, you're just ignoring the 11, 11 points here or 11 observations. You're just ignoring it. So that's why you should do something about it, uh, the missing data, right? This is scary. It's really clear. Yeah. This is very scary, right? I mean, this yeah. is a um, this is a great example. I thought it was a great example. Uh, like you, you can that's that's the big issue of missing data. You can't ignore it. You you might have results, and then I publish this, and then everybody starts eating tapioca in the world, and it's not gonna it's not gonna make a difference. You know, it's it's that's uh, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So that's good. So what do you uh, what do you can do? All right, so you have, uh, let's take a look at the data. So you, we just see the data. Uh, hold on. We can open a tapioca fabric. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think tapioca was, if they eat, they're more depressed, right? Yeah, if they, no, if yes. they eat, they're less depressed. So yes, everybody yeah. will start eating tapioca. <laughs> That's why they put tapioca in uh, jamba juice, I think. <laughs> tapioca is less yeah. weight less weight less depression yes, it is. less weight less depression so i have to say that i created this uh this uh fictional data set on my own and i was trying to think about what do i do now right you know i, I created i, put I love numbers. yeah and i was like what do i do and i always think about my house and stuff uh, so I have a son I, that has school problems, and uh, like my 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 wife is not depressed. There's nothing to do that. But I was just exp I was just thinking about well, when there's a lot of problems, when I don't help, my my wife gets mad, you know. But I didn't want to put like madness level. I put depression level. I thought it was better. And then we eat a lot of tapioca. My son eats a lot of tapioca, so I was like, well, let's put that one about about the tapioca groups, and that's how I came up with this. So it's not a real data set, guys. So this I think is the missing. You can you can sell this to a tapioca industry and make some money <laughs> on it. <laughs> That's right. So this is the um, this is the data missing. Okay, can you guys see? So let's do the simple one. Let's do the mean imputation. Okay. So let's calculate the means of the ones we have here, and then just add it over here. Okay. All right, so for that, we do um, some, I just wanna summarize to understand the means. So this is the variable that has the missing data and I'll put detail, um, it will give me everything. So the 50 percentile, I can also do just some, okay? For that, it will give me the mean standard deviation, all right? So the mean is 4.7. Okay, which is the mean right here, 4.8. Okay, so what I do for the mean imputation, I just put, you know, um, 4.8 and all those missing values. Let me let me just create a new variable. Um, I just put one. Oops. So I'm just creating the same. I'm just, I just added a new variable. 
Uh, so I want to show you what, what it looks like. So now I just created a new variable here, which is the same as this one. Okay, it's, it's, it's a copy. But now I'm going to input the data. So what was the number? 4.7? 4.8, so I have 11. I can just do that by manually, or I can use coding as well. Since we have just 11 variables, um, I'm just gonna add manually, okay. Like this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing. Do you see what I'm doing? So I calculated the means of the observed values I, need, I had, and I'm adding over here. Is this mean imputation? Yeah, this is main imputation. So now I have all the variables completed and then added to me, okay? So what I'll do, let's run it again. The, the testing just- Now I understand sense. very well. You understand? Good. Now, so let's very do, well. Let's do the me, uh, let's do the t-test and see if we get the same results, right? So let's do the t-test using the new variable that we created by tapioca. Oh, it's still giving me a, it's still giving me a, a significant result. Significant. Yeah. So it's still saying that tapioca is good. Maybe we should, we definitely eat tapioca. But what I'm saying is that um, you see that, you see the problem here. And I think you guys need to understand this. You see that those 11 values are making the difference, right? So if I use the mean of the values that are not missing, I still get the wrong answer. I still get the wrong uh, impression of the data because uh, it, it's like the, the ones that were changing the idea were the ones that dropped, okay? So this is a this is a, a a strategy you can use, okay? So that is uh, uh, that can be considered as a, um, a missing not at random then. Well, um, it's hard to know why it's not missing, right? So you're never gonna kind of relate, but you have to try to relate with something in the study. So what I'm saying that we, we, we saw with the complete data, right? We're not gonna have that when you have the missing data in your study. Like that was an example, but we will never see that happening, right? So we will see those 0 0.3, we would uh, impute and we would say, well, it's not making a difference. So probably those guys, um, you know, didn't make, an, a different, didn't make a difference in this case. Uh, but at the same time, um, Let's do the regression because the regression uses a little bit of the information from the study to see if there's, you know, to predict the, the water. So I feel that it's a little bit better than the mean. And let's see if we get a different result. Okay. All right. So to make it easier for you guys, I'm going to show this on Excel. Okay. Where you don't have to think too much about coding. Because in the end, guys, I don't know if you guys did the workshop, the statistics, statistics workshop, and I was so happy to see that Dr. David um, didn't know all the codes by heart. He was asking Alma about the codes because nobody know about the codes. Uh, I mean, you, I memorized a lot of them. I use them a lot of them, but I'm always going to the internet and saying, how do I get the, uh, you know, the, the robust regression um, uh, coding again I, I don't remember so I have like a, 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 a cheat sheet that I that I um, that I have that I kind of write down all the codings uh, but I, I can show you how to do on on the on the Excel so this is the same data set okay guys so this is the, the missing data I, and I actually already did that okay so what I'll do let's run a regression model so I can run regression model to predict my missing data here. Okay, so this is the mom with the missing data. And now the, the discussion that we have, right? What variable should I include? So I'm gonna include all of them. Son, school, house organization, son is happy, husband support. And should I, should I include e-tapioca? 
I don't want to include the tapioca, all right? I don't think it matters. So this, again, we can argue for hours on what it will be the best, what will be the best um, uh, model, okay? All right, so this is the result, okay? So I want you to just uh, follow me a little bit. Um, just the, look at the R square, the adjusted R square here is 0.77. So that means that this model is, pre it's, it's, uh, it's able to predict 77% of the variability in mom's depression. So that's a very huge R square. So this variables, um, like if I consider all of them, I can predict 77% how much um, mom's depression uh, level would change. Okay, so it seems to be a good model. It's a valid model. You see the p-value for the ANOVA here is significant. So let's just ignore that right now and I'll look at the coefficients, all right? So the coefficients show, um, uh, and guys, please, I know we, ex we extrapolated in time here. If you have to leave, please leave. It's fine. If you can stay, um, um, you know, great. If you cannot stay, it's fine, okay? I, I have time, so I'll, 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 I'll be here. And Jack Paolo, it's really uh, just uh, one, one point about the mean potential. Uh, what we did, we used to do is by uh, the mean potential by group treatments. Uh, I think you, you make the mean potential of the whole sample. That's right, that's right, Sui really. um, I think it's by, by group treatment because it's different, the mean of uh, yes. uh, who is receiving the treatment and who is not receiving the treatment, right? Yes, yes, that's a very good point. I think, um, I didn't think of that because like eat tapioca was not like a treatment group and I didn't think about that. But yes, you would calculate the mean for the group that is eating tapioca. So in fact, I have it over here, right? So you see the, 5.8, 5.58, 5 5.07. So you would add that, um, you know, whenever they are no, you would put 5.6. Whenever they are yes, you put, uh, well, not in this one, because this is the complete data. Where is the, yeah, this is the one. So 5.8, 3.71, okay. So you 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 put the mean on on here. Okay, so this is tapioca. If it's no or not, see no no, yes yes no no. So instead of so those two are no, so they would be yeah they're right here, five point eight, three point seven one. So five point eight. This is yes, it would be, where is it? Yeah, they're right here, 3.71. Okay, so this is a missing there. 3.71. Okay, guys, that's a very good point. And I'm sorry, I messed that up. So they're not missing. Yeah, this was, yes, 3.71. She's yes, 3.71. And now was 5.8. Yep, now we got it right. So let's run the t-test on this one, okay? Oh, even more significant. Oh no, this is the yeah, this is the, this is the right one. Okay, but that's right. Um you do for each me. Do you guys understand that? Yeah. 
Is that clear to everybody? But it is clear, clear but uh, it still doesn't answer the question that, so it has changed the outcome yes. of the study. Yes, so, I mean, the message is the same, um, but that's the right way to do it. I don't know why my camera is like that. So yes, um, but it makes sense. So you, you calculate the mean, for the group that eats tapioca, and then you substitute the missing value with that with that mean, okay? And you calculate the mean for people that don't eat tapioca, and then you add that mean to the group, okay? So um, this is what happens. So you get a significant result here. Um, just to just an example, okay? And guys, please don't try to make sense of this data set because I invented this. So it's what it's showing right here. It's giving the same. Um, we we had done wrong in the in in the beginning by just substituting everything and calculating all the um, you know the mean for all. Um, so we should do for the groups, and that's correct. Okay. So still we got the same. So then we did the regression here. Okay, everybody following me. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sometimes I want to hear like a yes or something. Um, okay, so this, this is the, the, so let's create the regression equation, right? So the, the regression equation will be something like this, like the mom, you know, depression level will be, you know, the, the, the missing data of the mom depression level will be equal to, and then I put the constant, all right? So will be the constant. And again, this is this uh, slide I did over here. I showed you in this slide. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do. Okay, um, I'm just gonna do this so we can see the coefficients here. So this is the formula. So the, the missing value that I'm predicting, so this, this cell, right? And the equation for that is I put the constant 9.07, so 9.07 plus, and then I put this value, which is school problems times this coefficient, school problem times this coefficient, plus house times the coefficient of house, and then sun happy, coefficient of sun happy. You, you follow what I'm doing? You understand this formula? Yes. Yes. And then when, once I get to the first one, right? So I got the first one here. So let's let's just see if it makes sense. So this is a zero, it predicted a zero one. Okay. So no school problems, right? Zero school problems, house very organized, son very happy, husband very supportive. So great. So mom depression level will be zero. So that makes a lot of sense. So it predicted you know, it's kind of predicted in a good way. And again, uh, the discussion we have, I'm not really worried about the model, like if it's significant or not, the coefficients at this point or at this example, uh, because I'm just predicting the missing data. Um, you know, I saw that it's 77% of our square is doing a good job on predicting, so I'm just gonna uh, predict with that. So I just grabbed that and, you know, pull those, up that down here so I can get the, the prediction, okay? So I'm just gonna copy this and plugged into there. Well, oh, sorry, no, I can't do that. Uh, so I'm just gonna substitute the missing values, right? Not, not all the values, of course not. So this one predicted zero and 10. So, so this one will be, so this is the, this is the variable this is the variable with the missing value, right? I'm just gonna plug it in here and then I'll just copy and paste this data. So this predicted a zero and a 10. So I'm just gonna put zero here and a 10. This predicted a five and a seven, five and seven. And this is a five, this is seven and seven.
This is an eight. Eight. Six. Five. So this is my complete one. Oops. No, this is a zero. I don't know if I added that already here. Let me check. Yeah, no. Some, oops. So I'm just going to generate a new variable. So this is the one. So I'm just gonna copy and paste will be easier. And, and for generating a new variable, you can put gen and then the name that you want to yeah, you, put you to the new variable. And, yeah, you can put generate or you can put gen and then the name of the new variable and then equals to whatever you put in. Yeah. Great, thank you. This is the one, so I'm just going to copy and paste to make it easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got the regression values inputted now. Okay, I'm just saving. So now I have the 40 variables. So let's do a t test. So this will be the new variable here by eating tapioca. Mm -hmm. You guys see the result? Yes. Not significant. Is that it? Finally. <laughs> yeah, not significant, right? Not significant. So now you have a you have like a, a decision to make. Like we know um because we had the complete data, so we saw that tapioca was not making a difference, right? In the complete data, <clears throat> but then in the in the missing data was. So, and then we predicted in two ways, doing the mean and doing the regression, and we got different results. Mm -hmm. So we would never know the, the complete data, right? Because we don't, we don't have that. So then let's say we're trying to decide how, how, how are we gonna deal with the missing data? And, uh, and now we have the two um, examples and they gave us two different uh, results. So which one, um, you know, we pick? Um, and in fact, maybe deciding because of the results, it's not probably the best idea, right? Because you can pick the result you want. Or the, I, I feel that the ideal way to decide is you decide the strategy first. Like you decide considering your data, you decide considering the variables. Um, so, you know, for example, you, I, I feel that the mean is it's, it's not usually the, the best way to go. Um, um, so I decided that the regression, because I think those variables can uh, predict a lot the, how, mom, how much a mom is depressed. So I'm going to use the depression level. So then I'll just stick to that. Whenever, whatever result I get, I'll do that. So I, sh I should, but, but you, in reality, you always kind of run maybe different ways and kind of see the difference. Um, so then you can try to think about the, the theory part. You would say, um, you know, do I think tapioca has an influence? You know, is there any biological reason that tapioca would have an influence on mom depression level? Um, uh, I can try to run a model including the tapioca uh, um, co uh, coefficient there. So I'll put the tapioca and, and see if it makes a difference on the model without the tapioca. I can do that as well. Um, and then I'm seeing that it's not making a difference. So if I if I think that 
okay, it shouldn't make a difference. There's no biological reason for tapioca making an effect of depression. So when I did the regression imputation, I, I confirmed that there was no, no difference. So um, maybe I'm probably right. So I'm gonna stick with that method of imputation. Um, so there's different ways you can take that decision, think different things you can consider. Of course, this is a silly example, a, sim a simple example. Um, when you're talking about you know, real study with real variables and real outcomes, you have to really think how you're gonna build that model. So the discussion we had before, um, so how you're gonna build that model. And you have to think about it, uh, what's the best way, what's the best model. Do you follow? Yes, Paolo, yes. And, and this is like a, a sensitivity analysis, what you just did, like compared to like yeah, two so, methods for missing data? Yeah, the sensitivity is always like, you um you do with one and you do with uh, other and you see if there is a difference usually a sensitivity is like you you call it sensitivity analysis when you um um like for example you have outliers in the data you remove an outlier and you run the 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 the, 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 the thing and then you put that outlier and see if it changes so that's like kind of sensitivity analysis um so it's 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 basically that so you're not, I wouldn't say that you were doing like a sensitivity analysis. I'm just doing different methods and, and kind of comparing them. Um, right. I, I, would, I would say that. But again, the way you decide the methods, it's always the, the dilemma. Like how I think is the best way to input uh, the method. And I could do like, this is, was a simple regression example. I can do that thing about the multiple imputation method. I do very, you know, several regressions. I do some other, and there's other more sophisticated ways of doing that. Um, and I think, guys, for you to understand, and and I and I think the whole purpose of PPCR, uh, it's you know, get you exposed to this so you understand that when you see, uh, when you're reading a paper, you're able to criticize the method that they use. You're able to have questions and 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 concerns about the way that they approach uh, missing data. If they explain a method, you might read a paper that they did a method that you don't really understand, but you at least saw that they did something for the missing data and you can go deep and try to search about the method that they use. Um, I think, I mean, we're not, we're not intending for you to learn to do multiple advanced imputation methods at all in the course. We want to show you, this is how you do it. You know, this is, uh, we want to give you, uh, material so you can go further and 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 look more on your own and then study more on your own and and kind of show you how simple it, it could be by showing you know, you this method uh, right here um so i hope this was helpful uh oh, i want to show one more example guys and i'm sorry because now i would have to go in a, in a few minutes but i want to show the covariate example okay so this was just an example of how to impute data using simple methods uh, and the issues that we have on it, okay? Can everybody, uh, did everybody um, follow that? And, and, and do you have any comments or anything? No comments. I think it was pretty clear, thank you. Great, great, that's good to hear. Um, so what, how do you think the Dr. Strong should do it? What method? I think that was uh, the Paul, right? Wow. Okay, we can talk about that later. <laughs> All right, guys, take a look at this, okay? If you're still hanging in there, whoever it's there. Are you still there? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, yeah. yes, we are. Sure. Okay, I lost the... Yes, you're here. <laughs> oh, I see, I see, I see. You know. We, we have been uh, replying in the chat. 
Oh, I'm, I'm not looking at the chat. I'm sorry. Okay. So we're basically, yeah. there's a huge consensus that would be multiple impl imputation. Okay. Yeah, I like the multiple imputation for sure. And especially he has a, a statistic that seems to know what he, she's doing. So I would, I would trust her and, and do that as well. Okay, so you can see my screen, right? So I want to show you, and this guy, guys, it's a real data. Um, it's something that we collected in the lab. I, of course, I just changed the, the data set a little bit to show, um, uh, to adapt for you guys. But this was something that, that we found and I thought it was interesting to show. So we were exploring this data and we were looking at the association of pain, okay? Um, and we have pain in different ways, like uh, a pain collected as an, as an average, like how much pain have you felt in your knees uh, over the last week. So this is this variable right here, okay? So I'm just gonna sum that for you guys to see. So it's a scale from zero to 10. We got 50 observations, the mean is six. So um, zero, no pain, 10, very painful, okay? And then I was looking at um, some regression models with that, and I was looking at race. So we had the variable of race. So we had race, uh, so we can do like, have race. So you can see here, we got two Asians, 16 black, African Americans, native Hawaiian, uh, 25 white. So this is the categories that we have for race. Okay. So I wanted to see the difference between black and uh, other races, uh, more than just looking at each uh, type of race, uh, each race there because there was evidence uh, that we read before and there was someone here at the lab that uh, actually mentioned to me like, oh, take a look at that in our data because I saw that uh, for some reason, uh, blacks uh, report uh, or African-Americans, they report more, uh, more pain, uh, unusual, especially if they're, they have chronic pain and blah, blah, blah. So we were talking about that. I was like, okay, let's, let's explore that. So I ran a regression model. I'll, I'll show you to your regress fast average and this is the dummy race. Dummy race is just uh, zero to one. Uh, uh, one is um, uh, black or and the, and the other is other races. Okay, so hold on. I'm just gonna sum dummy race so you can understand. Oops, uh, tab, dummy race. So you see the dummy race variable right here white and others i have 34 so i just got that race variable and broke down in two so i got white and others and i got black okay so 16 black 34 white and others so i ran the regression model with the dummy race look at that so um black in this case is one and the other is zero so the way you interpret this so the model is uh, significant you can see the model is significant. The R square is 0.8. Okay, so 8% of the variability of pain is being explained by race. Uh, and it's a significant uh, uh, coefficient. And this coefficient is positive. So what that, what that means is that whenever the person is black or African American, uh, on average, he feels 1.3 more pain than being white and others. Um, so on a scale from zero to 10. So on average, people, they are black or African-Americans, they report more pain. So that's interesting, right? So we were like, okay, this is, uh, this is interesting. Maybe we can write about that in our sample, try to correlate that with uh, chronic pain and look at the other evidence and stuff. So then I started exploring more of the variables, okay? So I was, I was exploring a lot of models. So I was doing that. And uh, are you guys following me? Yes. All right. Yes. yes. Okay. So I decided to put, for example, um, education on the on the game. So I'm just gonna tab ed education for you to see. So this is the way we collected education: some high school, high school diploma, some college, college, bachelor's, master's, and other. Okay. So you can see the distribution here. So again, I didn't want to look at the, the specific classifications. So what I did, I dummy race, I, I dummy uh, uh, coded the, the, the race, the, the education. 
So we'll, I'll show you what I did. And this is the variable that I created, I called it dummy education. So what I, basically what I broke down was college or no college, okay? So I created less than, less than college or college degree. So college will be, you know, once you have the some college here, you know, this will be one category or no college. So, I'm gonna, so you see that it was a perfect split, 25 in each group, okay, just so you know. So now let's see uh, uh, if education has some influence on that relationship of uh, race and pain. So what I did, um, regress this one, regress average, dummy race, and I'll just add, oops, education here. So now I want you to take a look at the coefficient of dummy race, okay? You see that it's not significant. So before it was, when I put that alone in the model, it's making a lot, I mean, it's, it's, it's not making a lot, I mean, it's, it's influenced how much pain. So it's showing that if the person is black, they will report more pain. But when I put education into the game, now education is very significant and dummy race is not. So what does that tell you? What can you, what can you talk about this somewhat? And now look at the, look at the, the, the significance of my model. Like the R square here, just that R square is 20%. So this is ex like, this two variables are explaining 20% of my variation in, 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 in pain. And before dummy race was just explaining 6% or 8%. So can, can someone try to um, make the rationale? So again, not, I'm not looking for you to interpret coefficients or anything. I'm just, uh, I just want to understand what happened. There's no it right or wrong. It seems like the education was confounding the relation between race and uh, pain level. Okay, so how, how would you, uh, how can you explain that a little bit? Just just elaborate a little bit. You're right, but how elaborate so we, so we can all understand what you're, what's happening. So, so um, maybe black or African-Americans has um, in this sample less education, which uh, explains their um, higher experience of pain. So if you take two samples, white and black, and you split them to high and low, lower education, um, people, in, whether they're white or black, um, if they have less education, they'll experience more pain. But because there is a relation between education and race in your sample, um, you will find that there is a relation between race and um, level of pain. Yes. Anybody wanna add any other comments before I talk about that? Francisca? Uh, no, yeah, no, just, it's, yeah, uh, it's confusing. <laughs> okay, so you think it's confusing. So the idea is like that. Before, so let's say we just look at this and we were like, okay, race, black have more pain. So let's write a paper about that, you know, you know, and so this could be a justification of, for the future studies on chronic pain, they should always control for, for a race because, I can show here that black, you know, black has more pain. So if I don't consider the other variables, I could mislead my thinking and, 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 and decide that this is the truth, okay? But then when I put uh, uh, education in, in, the, in the game, so let's just interpret what education is, is it's happening here. So this is a negative coefficient. So what is it saying? Uh, and again, I don't wanna make it complicated, just follow my, my rationale. So the education here is, um, uh, so one is a college degree or more. So if you have a college degree or more, you report less pain. On average, about 1.8 in a, in a zero to 10 scale. On average, you report more pain. So you kind of think about that. So, okay, so if I'm, if I'm more educated, I have more uh, school and, and, you know, more educated, I report less pain. Does that make sense? Uh, and remember, and that, that you have to consider that how we ask uh, about pain, like how we collect that data. Do you have pain uh, on a scale from zero to 10 in your knee right now or on average on the past seven days? So let's say if I say that question to someone that never went to school 
or live in a rural area and never have dealt with the uh, uh, scale type of uh, classification. Like it, they don't understand what the zero to 10 scale is. Um, um, you know, they, they might say that the level of pain wrong because of the, just, just, just because they don't have education or, or because of that. And, and if, I, if I have a PhD, you know, I really understand the question. I can really understand, um, you know, what I should consider to answer that question. So I, I you know, I'll, I'll say the question that I really think it is. Um, so, and then age, be, and, and then race became not significant. So, um, uh, so the idea is that it's, there's not, it's not race that it's driving the pain, but it's the education that that race has that it's probably driving the pain. So, and then we can look at um, uh, like, um, you know, the, 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 the education levels in, 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 in black. Let me, let me try to do that, hold on. Yeah, let's do that box. One second. Okay, can you see this graph? Yeah, the box plot. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the box plot. So just looking at this, you can see that blacks, and for whatever reason, we're not discussing the reason now, so we can just see that the blacks, and this is level of education, right? So zero will be, you know, some high school. So as it goes up, you know, level of education goes up. So you can see that in, in my sample, blacks have, you know, the mean for black or the median or, you know, the mean probably here is normally distributed. I don't know. So it's, it's, they have less education than whites. Okay. So I was thinking that race was doing the effect, like being black was the main reason of, of having pain. Um, and, and when I put education in the model, education is explaining more. So dummy race was mm -hmm. actually out of the model now. So it's not, the, it's not the fact that they're black, it's the fact that the education that those black people has, it's influencing more on pain. So then I lose that rationale that being black has more pain. It's actually not being educated that, that makes you have more pain. So maybe for future studies, I should, always think about controlling for education if I have, um, you know, if I have black, uh, a good portion of black people in my, um, in my sample, for example. You, Hi, can you Paola, see? Can I ask you something? Sure, sure. Um, this is Julia, sorry for the interruption. Um, I, I, yeah, then, uh, what is, uh, why, so uh, if education is more important than race, why the adjusted R square is bigger for race than for education? It shouldn't be the opposite. So, do you understand what the R square, the adjusted R square, is before we discuss that? Yeah, you said it is like what, um, how much of the variability can be explained by the variables, right? Yes. Yes. Good. So when you have a model that has one variable only, you always look at the R square, not the adjusted R square. And I'll tell you. So the, the R square for this model right here, just with the race, is 8%. So this is saying that the variability of pain, how much pain moves, um, you know, it's being explained um, 
six uh, percent of how much pain moves is being explained by race. So there's other things that explain how pain moves. For example, depression. For example, um, inflammation or whatever. But race is uh, it's influence like it's it's explaining six percent of how how much pain moves. When I put another variable in the model, uh, the R square always going to go up uh, because I have one more variable to, to try to explain. Uh, so you have to look at the adjusted I square because the adjusted I square uh, uh, adds a penalty to the fact that you add another uh, variable to the model. So the R square, uh, the adjusted R square is just correcting for that. But still, if you compare the adjusted I square, which is 20% on this model, and the R square that it's 8% on this model, so that means that um, uh, dummy and like education add twelve uh, percent, right? Twelve percent of you know to more to the explanation. Let's do one thing. Let's do one without dummy race. No, yeah, no, I I got it. I just don't want to waste yeah. your time. I saw eighty no, percent. Actually, uh, I saw wrong. Thank you, and oh, okay. I, I apologize for that. So sorry. Yeah, so it's more now. So you see, I put now just education in a model. This is a simple uh, model with one variable. Look at the R squared, 22. So it seems like education is the big one here. Race is not, it's not the big one. So when I put both in the model, I have a R squared of 20. And when I put just education, it's 22. So it's even, it, it explains even more how much, um, you know, pain varies. So Pain is really being driven by, I mean, not being driven by, but it's being influenced by education. So it's not, um, it's not race. Do you, do you mm -hmm. guys see? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So again, guys, this was just an example of how, why we want to control for covariates. Like this is a covariate adjustment. So we're adjusting for education to understand the effect of race on pain. So to understand the relationship of race and pain. So if I looked at it alone, it might, I may be misleading, but if I consider another covariate, I can, I can appreciate the true effect of that. And I can even add more. So I can, you know, I can do that and add more variables to see if there's any more variables influence education. For example, how much depression level I have. Okay, so now I have a different, different, uh, but you see that education is still significant. Depression is not significant uh, in this case, in this sample, in, in this way that depression was collected, okay? So this is not, uh, so always you should limit the results of your study to your study, um, like according to your population and everything. So um, I'm not saying that depression doesn't affect pain. We know that actually it's true for other uh, for other studies. So right in this sample, in this case here, like depression level, this is a self depression level zero to ten scale that we ask. Uh, it's not making a difference, um, uh, but education is definitely making a difference, and race is still not making a difference. So now uh, you see the R square is 26, so, so increased a little bit. So you should look at the adjusted R square, which is 21. So it's actually decreased from the education, uh, R square is 22 here. So education is still the best model. So education only is still the best model. Uh, so I can predict pain uh, just using education more than I can predict pain using race, education, and depression. In this sample, again, you understand? Yes, thank you. Yes, it's great. Great, guys. Um, I'm sorry, but I think we extrapolated a little bit. Um, I hope you got the idea on the um, on the imputation methods. I gave you a few examples. Uh, you should be able to look on your own. You know, if you have questions, you can contact me or every other TA should know. Um, this is a covariate adjustment example. So you should think about the covariates that can influence your results before the study. Um, um, if you know something from the evidence, um, you, sh you know you should control for. For example, let's say I know that education influences pain, and I read that in other studies. So I definitely want to include education in my model. 
but it may be that in my sample, education is not being influenced. Like it's not making an effect. Uh, that can happen too. Like everything out there is saying one thing and then when you test it in your sample, you don't see that in your sample. Uh, so then you don't have to control for it. But you might want to include in a model anyway, just because everybody else says that it's important. So even if it's not a significant, you should leave it on the on the model. So like Dr. Fregni said, you know, building a model and considering those things are more of an art than a uh, than um, you know like a method. Um, so there's a, you know everyone can make it a little bit different considering some information that they know or not. All right. Any questions, any concerns, any comments? Hey, yes, I have a question. Um, so if the, the regression model showed that all the variables included were statistically significant, then you would say all of them like impact on the I mean, the thing is, I don't know how to differentiate if the impact is to the um, uh, independent variable you're trying to prove, or now you just have many independent variables and the covariates don't act like confusers, confusers, I don't know. Um, so you would say each of them independently or all together, like affect the dependent, I don't know. Yeah, so when you build a model, Natalia, that's a, I mean, that's a common um, doubt that everybody has about the concept. You building a model, right? So when you when you write the equation, you 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 are trying to explain like all those variables that I put in a model, they have a certain influence on my outcome, and the coefficients would tell you this is how they are influencing the outcome. Um, and this is the best model to kind of predict the outcome. Um, so ideally, you want to include uh, include uh, coefficients or variables that are significant to the model, so you have a, a significant prediction uh, or a valid prediction to the model. But sometimes you may want to force a variable in the model just because you think it's a very important uh, variable uh, for theoretical reasons or biological reasons. Like for example, the the um, the tapioca example. Like um, even though um, the level of uh, uh, sun happiness was not significant in my model, I decided to include because I really think, and and maybe research have showed that um, you know how much a sun happiness level can influence on a mom's depression. Um, so. I think your question is more like how how to get to the best model, how to decide the the the, the variables that go in a model, um, isn't it? Um, and if it is, there's no, um, I mean, there's there's different ways to think about that. And this is the 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 the, the dilemma with model building. Um, you can you can go for the significance, you can go for the the biological reason. Um, ideally, you, if you can match those, it's great. Um, depends on depending on the ob objective of the model. So, like, if your model is being created to predict something, um, then you can add some variables. If the model is just to creating to to show the association of things, uh, that's that's a different uh, way of thinking on how to build the model as well. But there's a lot of other things that you should consider when you're building a model as well. It's not uh, so much straightforward. You have to see if it meets the assumptions of a linear model. If not, you have to do some other type of model. Um, so it's not something that you will um, get it right away. And I feel that um, we're all learning all the time with this. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, thank you, thank you. Any other comments, concerns? questions. All right, guys, I think that's it.
Um, sorry, I couldn't go over all the imputation methods. Um, I hope you um, took advantage of this and try to learn a little bit more. Um, I try my best to show everything and I hope you, uh, you got something out of it. It was really clarifying, Paolo, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, the issue about confounding and effect modifiers, that's a whole different discussion too. Like one, one variable can confound the other, can change the effect on, of that other variable in the model. So this is other discussions. And, and I think you guys are gonna, did you, I'm not sure if you guys had regression already and had that lecture. But um, there's a lot to discuss on that. I recommend the workshop that they have in July. You don't have to do the workshop at the year you're doing the PPCR. You can do next year, for example, because um, it, it, was, it was done last week. But that's a good um, three days that you focus on regression. Um, I think it's worth it. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you so much. I think everyone can understand. And uh, if we have any question, maybe we will send you an email. Yes, yes, you can send that email. Or call me on Reaver too. I'm on Reaver. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.